Thank you. Yay. Good to see you all here, um, and thank you for inviting me to speak at Joycon Berlin. Um, so, as the introducer have said, my name is Hoi Lam. Uh, I'm the lead developer advocate uh, for uh, Google on the Android Web project, and you can follow me on Twitter uh, at HoiTab. Um, and also, if you want to hashtag anything, then you can hashtag AndroWare and also hashtag, of course, uh, Joycon DE or Joycon Berlin. So, um, first, uh, the first questions I get quite a lot is, you know, how is AndroWare going? Um, and I'm very pleased to say that um, during the holiday season last year, we're seeing over 70% growth uh, in activation uh, for Android Wear devices. Uh, and that's even before uh, we've launched Android Wear 2.0. And as this ecosystem kind of grows, uh, we're seeing increasing momentum. So uh, before uh, Google I.O. Uh, this year, uh, we had 23 different watches, and we, we basically doubled it uh, to 46 um, during this year. And um, here are just some examples. So um, on, the, uh, on, on this side, we have Gas, which is a very fashionable uh, color kind of watch. In the middle, we have Movado, uh, a Swiss uh, watchmaker that, is, um, uh, that have a very iconic minimalist design. And on this side, we have the second generation uh, Michael Kors uh, watch, which is now fully circular. So there's no flat tire whatsoever. So that's some of the watches that we are, we are launching this year. Uh, from Europe, uh, we have the uh, Tagoya, um, and this is the new version, the Tagoya Modular 45, um, and Tag is very happy with kind of the first version that they're do now doing the second version. Um, in the middle, you have the Louis Vuitton, uh, and I'm lucky enough to, to be wearing one today, so if there are time at the end and you want to see it in, in, in person, uh, then please come up to me. Uh, last but not least, we also have Mont Blanc uh, and the Mont Blanc Summit. Um, again, it's the first watch that they're doing uh, that is um, running on Android Wear. So as you can see, uh, we're, we're really building momentum in terms of uh, OEM offering, new watches, and new brands. So what are we going to cover today? I'm going to cover uh, three things. So the first thing that I'm going to cover is something that actually has been around since API 23, but it may not be immediately obvious. And also some of the things that uh, I was using, again, wasn't immediately obvious when, when, when I first switched over to API 23. So I want to share some of the tips with you. The second uh, is the new Wear UI library uh, that we have launched at Google I.O. I'm not going to repeat the content that we had at Google I.O., but instead I'm going to shift over to uh, maybe give you a little bit more context of what we're doing, and then some of the pitfall um, that I've, I myself fall into when, when I try to switch from the uh, old wearable library to the new wear UI library. And last but not least, I'll give you a preview of what I'm going to talk about at uh, GD, uh, G, uh, Google Developer Day. Crackle tomorrow. Um, so I have a couple minute lightning talk um, at Crackle. Um, but because I have a little bit more time here, I could kind of extend the content a little bit so you hear a little bit more. Um, and that's no excuse to skip over the session because my other speakers, so that, that is, a, it, was a, it is going to be a lightning talk session. So the only part that we repeated is my section, which is at the very front for the fi first five minutes. So if you skip the first five minutes, um, you can hear all new content uh, about Android TV, uh, the XO player that we have, and also um, the pro audio stuff. So it's really worth uh, color watching. But today I'm going to give you a preview. So let's kick off with API 23. Um, as many of you have seen, um, Android Wear is all about giving the user a choice and basically say, you know, you can wear what you want. It's, it's a piece of, uh, 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 or it's an object that you are wearing. So it really needs to fit your own personal style. And unsurprisingly, a lot of our users are going overwhelmingly uh, towards a circular uh, design. And they find it comfortable to wear, they find it actually fits uh, much better uh, to their fashion sense. So um, it, is in, it is really important that developers take care of this new uh, screen form factor. Of course, if you do nothing with your Android app, this is what it will look like. Um, so if you look at the uh, red uh, square, 
essentially that's the area that Android will try to lay out all the components that you have. Um, it will treat it like a square, and um, so if you have things that are top line or bottom line, they will just uh, they, they might be cropped uh, on the side there. And the simplest thing to do uh, since the beginning uh, of Androidware is to uh, put what we call a box inset layout uh, in it, and then what it does is it group uh, all the components uh, to the inside square of the circle. And this works perfectly if you have a very, very simple UI. You know, if you have a message and then yes and no button, that's fine. Um, and fortunately, not all our apps are like that. You know, our apps are much more functional. You know, our apps are much more complex uh, than what is being shown here. So what, what happens you know, if you have something a little bit more complex? Um, since API uh, 23, we have introduced two new uh, identifier, round and not round. Um, and they work just like um, all the uh, density uh, qualifier that you have um, before. So you know, if you are using dash H uh, DPI, uh, it's, it works in exactly the same way. And for anyone that have used Androidware from uh, the, the very first version, uh, the 1.0, uh, we have had uh, something called a watch view stop, which is uh, a component whereby you can specify uh, a round layout or square layout um, depending on uh, basically the form factor of the watch. And so when I switch over to API 23, the natural thing to do is to do this and say, hey, I have two layout files. Let's go ahead and uh, basically specify them as round and not round, two layout files, done. And then as I iterate on my project, I then realize, wait a minute, you know, maintaining two layout files is a pain. Because if you look at um, the, the screen design between the circular and the square, they basically have the same components. You know, I have the heading, you know, I have the list view, I have the different components. I don't change color the elements uh, between round and square. So why should I have two layout files? Because they will just look exactly the same. What I then realize is, actually, the thing that is changing between the two layout are the paddings. So all I needed to do is to actually have one single layout file, but have two di different dimension files for round and not round. And I find it much easier to maintain uh, between, the, uh, between the two versions. Um, so when you're adding a new component to the screen, you just add it to one layout file, and it'll just be there. And all you need to take care of are the padding, uh, especially at the top and the bottom. So that's at least my tip of using um, the new uh, ident uh, identifier, uh, round and not round, um, is through the dimension file. Next, the chin. So um, fortunately and unfortunately, some of the watches does have a chin at the bottom, uh, which is the uh, black area that's being shown here. Um, and a lot of them for good reason. So uh, a lot of the watches might have light sensor so that it uh, dynamically adjusts the brightness of the screen depending on how much ambient light there is. It's a, uh, it's a battery saving uh, uh, option and also uh, it helps the user see the screen much better. So it's there for a reason. But when it's there, it's a little bit of a pain. So if you, do not, uh, if you do nothing, then this kind of things will happen. So you might have a button down at the bottom, but then half of it will be covered up. And that's the best case. You know, some button might even disappear altogether. So what do you do? Um, the first thing is, uh, within the Android system, and this doesn't just apply to Androidware, but to all Android devices, there is this uh, attribute called fit system windows uh, equals to true. And it's um, basically something that we have built in to the operating system. Uh, to take care of uh, the status bar the uh, and, the, and the bottom uh, kind of home buttons, etc. So you could actually use that, this attribute. But unfortunately for the eagle eye among you, you will see that it get rid of all the paddings um, of, the, uh, of the button. And it is for um, actually a good technical reason that we're doing that. And Ian Lake, one, one of my colleagues, have actually wrote a whole blog post about this. Um, um, on, uh, for, the, uh, for the Android OS. So if you are really interested in you know, the deep technical uh, backstory about why it get rid of padding, then please have a look at this blog post. Uh, but for the moment, we need to solve this um, problem. So what's the simplest way to do this? 
And it's turned out uh, when I tap on uh, Nick Butcher's shoulder that he said, oh, why don't you try inset drawable? And I go, what? Inset drawable? I've never heard of it before. And it turned out to be extremely simple. All you need to do is to create an XML file, and I'll run you through quickly. Uh, all five lines of it, including the, the top line, which is just inset. So one uh, thing that you need to do is to just specify the uh, drawable that you have uh, within that. So in this case, it's just the heart uh, shape that I have. And then next, just put in the inset. And what it does is it pad it out. And so now you have a lovely um, uh, drawable that's, uh, that's properly padded and take care of the chin. Um, so that's all great. You know, we coded it. It works. So what's next? Um, one of the things that um, developer asked me is, hey, with all these variety of Android devices, should I go out and buy all of them in order to test it? So it really depends, because if you like your watches and you want an excuse to go out and buy all your watches, then fine. Go out, you know, talk to your boss and say, hey, boss, you know, I really need six different watches. I, I need to you know, use the corporate account in order to do that to test it properly. Fine, you, know, you go ahead and do that. But if you're a little bit you know, st uh, strapped for cash, you know, if you're just testing out a, a startup idea, um, et cetera, um, we have actually put up um, all the different screen um, combinations that we have um, as emulator uh, images um, in Android Studio. So all the different configurations that is in the market, um, it is uh, in, in, in this. Um, in fact, um, I think about a year ago, we even put up images of watches that was to come. And we go, oh my god, have we just leaked uh, some information? Um, and luckily, uh, it turned out to be fine. Um, but uh, yeah, this is the one place to basically have a look and see uh, all the different screen uh, configurations that we have in Androidware. So next, the Wear UI library. Um, this is something that we have launched um, at Google I.O. as a beta, and now it is actually a, a finalized version, so you can use it in production. Um, and what happened previously is um, we uh, iterate very quickly, and we, uh, and we, and we built it up uh, relatively fast uh, under a uh, closed source library called Wearable. And it includes other components in, in Android Wear. Um, but as the platform matures, we actually graduated it to, um, to uh, become a component of the main Android support library. And you might ask us, you know, why are you doing this? You know, why are you kind of putting time um, into moving essentially a class to another? Um, first thing is, is not as simple as that, um, because uh, we, are, we, we actually also took the time to review uh, how the developer community have used those classes. And, and, and see basically how those classes are interacting uh, all together. And also, by moving to the main support library, there are uh, a couple of advantages. So the first one is you can expect much more frequent update. So previously, um, the library update was tied to uh, OS updates, so they're much more infrequent, you know, maybe once a year, maybe once every six months. Uh, but now, uh, because support library kind of rolls out once every four weeks, once, once every six weeks, then you know, we can be much more, more responsive uh, to your feedback, especially around bug fixes. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, the naming consistency. Uh, when we were uh, a separate project, uh, we basically named things whatever we like, and that turned out to be a bad thing um, when you're, when you're you know, really skilled in using the Android support library. So by bringing it together, we increase the naming consistency. Um, but there's a little bit of a catch, because if you have used uh, Android Wear 1.0 and the, and the, and the, and the uh, previous version of the support library, then you know, some of the methods will change. But they tend to be a one-to-one -one, uh, kind of mapping. Uh, last but not least, it is now open source. Uh, so people have been asking me, you know, hey, can I have a look at your code? You know, what have you done uh, to my view? Um, and because we are now part of the Android support library, there is a whole open source uh, process around it, so you should be able to now uh, you should now be able to check it out from uh, GitHub and um, see what we have done.
And all you need to do uh, in order to use it is by just adding this line uh, into Gradle. Um, the, uh, and from the keynote, I've just checked, it is now 26.0.2 uh, if you wanted the very, very, very latest version. Um, sorry about that. Um, a typo. Next, um, so what have we done uh, with all the classes? Um, there are three things that we have done uh, with the classes. The first is to migrate. So um, a lot of the classes we just took uh, from, the, uh, from the old package and moved it to the new package. Change some of the naming in order to make it uh, consistent. And those naming are mainly around uh, the, uh, the method names uh, and attribute names. So an example of this will be the box inside layout. That thing that I showed you earlier where you know, it groups the, uh, all your uh, components to the center of the square, that's one of the uh, classes that we have migrated. Um, the second one is merge. Um, so in the previous version of the, uh, of the Android Wear library, we have wearable recycler view and we have wearable list view. And developers are going, hey, which one shall I use? They still exist in the, in the old library, uh, but for new development, we're not recommending kind of those classes for use. And in terms of package name, it moved uh, from uh, wearable view to wear.widget. Um, so that's the namespace change. And if you want to check out um, how the different views kind of all map together, um, if you could search uh, at the top using the where UI library, and then there's a section that describes in a big table basically all the different classes and what they have become. Um, and if you have any questions, just um, DM me on Twitter and you know, I will try to try my best to answer those. So that's clearly an overview of what we have done. And um, what I want to do is to uh, dive a little bit deeper into some of the, uh, some of the things that uh, I find, at least, when I was using some of the classes um, that is within the UI library. So the first thing is, although I said, hey, the box inside layout is really simple, when I change it to the new library, this is what my view looked like. And I go, oh my god, what is wrong? And there was no error from um, Android Studio whatsoever. And I go, oh, come on, you know, this is supposed to work. So I actually raise a bug against my team. And then they go, oh, yeah, by the way, um, this have changed. So if I go back, this previous um, attribute is called layout box. And now it's changed the box to the edges. Woohoo. And I go, wait, how come Android Studio didn't warn me? And they say, oh, that's kind of like a bug slash feature of Android Studio that you know, if you have um, XML configuration file and the attribute changes its name, it actually does not highlight it to you. So if you have uh, views that you build up programmatically, any changes to the method names will be picked up automatically. But if you have um, uh, layout um, attributes uh, in Android Studio, that is in itself is not picked up automatically the program will compile, uh, but it will not run correctly. So if that does happen to you, then I will recommend that you, know, you just go and check the reference and see which one is wrong. Um, in the meantime, I have raised a bug against Android Studio and just say, you know, hey, can you guys you know, please have a look at this problem? Because it's, um, it's quite easy to fall into if you have a layout XML file and certain attribute kind of changes its name. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll have a fix, a proper fix at some stage. So this is what it looks like afterwards. Woo, -hoo. one line change. Next, um, so um, in Android, a lot of things are around. 
And so how do you do something like this where you have a recycler view and then you want a gray uh, circular view around a, um, around a drawable? So in Android Wear, um, in the previous version, in gray, we have a uh, circle image view and we have circular button. Um, but what we're finding is uh, developers actually wanted something that is a little bit more flexible. Um, so we have changed those to uh, render drawable uh, from circle image view at the top. And what that enables you to do is not just to create circles, but also to create rounded square or rounded rectangle as well, so you can specify radius. Um, and in the second one, uh, instead of building our own circular button, we just go, wait a minute, that if you, if you kind of squint hard enough, it's just a floating action button. It's a fab. So why don't we use that? Um, and, and so that's what we're doing. Uh, so we're just reusing the design library um, component there, and instead of kind of doing, doing, our, own, doing our own thing. So if, I, if we have a look at it around the drawable, um, it looks really sensible. So if you want to do something really simple like this, you know, have something uh, in the middle of your screen, you know, that's circular, um, you can just specify the radius, um, and you could um, put the radius in, uh, in DP and then just multiply it by a number, and that will give you the, the pixel. Very, very simple. But what if you want to do something like this, where you have a class within a class within a class, um, so you might have your activity, and then you have your recycler view, and then you have uh, your view holder. And in the radius, you can't actually get access uh, to the resources. So when you're doing that, you can find, you can hard code it, not recommend it. Um, or what can you do? Um, so what are the, um, what a way to get around that in this instance, if you, if you just want a circle, uh, is by setting it to the maximum uh, integer, and the system will take care of it. Um, so if you set the radius to uh, a ridiculously large number, um, we will basically work it out and, and become a circle. And this is the kind of thing that, um, the kind of feedback that we really want to hear from you, where you go, hey, in certain instances where I'm using your class, I'm having difficulty in doing certain things. Can you, tell, you know, can you tell me how to do this? And some of this uh, might have an answer already. So like this, we have an answer, and we'll probably need to update our documentation to just tell the developer that, you know, hey, set your radius to maximum, and we will take care of it for you. Um, or you know, maybe there are certain use cases that we're not taking care of in real usage um, that we should be taking, uh, taking a look at. So please do um, kind of let us know if there are uh, instances that are like that. Um, this library is relatively new. Um, it literally just went final, uh, I think, back in August. So um, yeah, just DM me um, with any comments or any questions that you have with the Wear UI library. So this is a preview of tomorrow's talk. Um, some of it is um, not strictly UI. Um, but a lot of it is to do with a larger uh, kind of UI pattern. So I hope that you, know, you, will, uh, you, you will see some benefit. And some of the advice is not just for Android Wear, but for any uh, IoT project that you may be doing. So the first thing is, uh, actually, the first point is related to Android Wear. Um, tell us if your uh, Android Wear app is standalone. Um, so since uh, 2014, when we uh, launched Android Wear, we have um, a couple of ways that you can connect uh, the watch to the phone. Uh, the first way that we launched with was uh, Bluetooth. That's like the table stake. And then subsequently, we've added Wi-Fi and LTE uh, to the mix. And with Android Wear 2.0, uh, you no longer need a component on the phone. And you could just send HTTP requests directly from the watch. And what we would do is on the watch, we have a proxy, and we will work it out automatically uh, which route it should take. Um, so you know, if it is connected to the phone, and the phone have good kind of Bluetooth connection, um, then we'll just use the phone. Or alternatively, if the phone is not around, we'll switch on the Wi-Fi and, and, and basically deal with it from there. Um, so it's a really simple way uh, for a developer for de to develop and uh, you could just use the connection logic that you have already got on your mobile phone app and just run it on the watch, and it will just work. And another benefit to this is, of course, supporting actually iPhone users. So Android Wear support both Android phone and iPhone. And for users that are on the iPhone, 
um, of course, we can't actually deploy an extra module um, onto the iOS app, and also it adds complexity because you know you 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 might have different teams, and if you need to coordinate multiple teams to do one thing, uh, it just makes it that much more difficult. So hopefully, with this uh, new architecture, it's much simpler for you to build uh, for both Android and iOS. It will be essentially the same code. Last benefit, but not least, is that we have now got the Play Store on the watch. So you could actually, um, the user could actually download your app directly uh, from the watch itself in Android Wear 2.0. Um, so what do we need in order to end up on the Play Store on the watch is um, adding this little metadata tag. So you need to tell us that your uh, um, Android Wear app, so this will be the, in the Android manifest of your Wear uh, app, in your Android Wear app, uh, you need to tell us that the app itself is standalone and equals true, then we'll go ahead and put it onto the uh, Play Store on the watch. Um, the reason why we're doing this is uh, just in case that your, uh, your app have certain assumptions built in, um, in terms of relying on the, on the phone uh, app uh, to do certain things. Um, that's why we are kind of building it in, in such a way. If you have feedback on, on this, um, then we would love to hear it. Next, uh, standalone architecture. So um, another question that I get asked quite a lot is, you know, how should I you know, architect my uh, application, not just for Wear, but for all the different form factors? And you know, we have all been there. And this is the normal diagram that you have seen in a lot of conferences, including ours, actually, um, where we go, hey, we all know model view controller. The problem has been solved. You should just kind of put the model and you know, put all the display logic on the device solved. You know, this has been sold for 10, 15 uh, Yeah, don't worry about it. it. It'll be fine. It'll just work out. Um, uh, model view controller applies. But when you actually, uh, there are some very practical I play, and hopefully I'll go through a couple of those uh, with you. So today, um, with, uh, as, you, as many of you know, the, uh, the world is very much a phone-centric world. Well, but what we're seeing is that users have increasingly um, added different devices, really used the different devices for that use case. And um, uh, trapped that uh, developer quite um, mobile first. And one of the things I'm doing for mobile is the phone number. And that's fine to a certain extent. But what happens is when you take a phone number, then it's uh, very easy to then make the assumption that the user only have one device. And I've seen time and time again that when we, uh, when we go to uh, a developer and they're saying, hey, I'm really interested in developing a standalone Android Wear 2 app, um, can you tell us how can we get around this? And then when we, when we look around, look at their system architecture, they have built certain assumptions that make it extremely hard. Um, one of them is um, basically assuming single user, single device, which means that you can only have one active security token. And if you do that, then uh, what tends to happen, and, and I'm sure that you have encountered apps whereby if you log into one device, it logs you out of another one. And, and that's something that, um, is really, really frustrating as you, um, as you expand to different form factor, or maybe even if your user just have two phones. And, and so I would argue that um, even if you don't do kind of uh, the, the whole shebang, the whole full automatic synchronization, you should at least assume that a user have multiple, de multiple device. And I would was, I was categorize that into three different uh, kind of uh, level of support for multi-device. So ranging from the simple to the complex, um, so if you're just starting out, you know, especially on your weekend project, then I would say just assume that you can actually log in simultaneously uh, on multi multiple devices. And what that means is you know, assume that there will be a multiple active security token um, that, your, that your user will be using. Second, have a um, menu kind of refresh to sync the device. So let's say you have ordered um, a taxi on your watch, and then when you unlock your phone or when you launch the app, 
then you just go and go to your backend and say, hey, you know, have this user order anything else, you know, from any other device, and and basically add it into uh, into your app. Um, so those will be also very simple to do. And then you know, once you have achieved your Series C funding uh, for your startup, and you have you know a lot of cash, and you want to build the best best experience. Then of course you can do the the whole you know fully automatic you know syncing all the device all the time via via cloud messaging, um, so that you know all the state uh, of your app is synchronized among all your uh, among all your application. Um, but at the very very minimum, I would argue if you are starting a new project today, please assume that the the user have multiple devices. That's the very very minimum. Um, before I finish off this topic, I just want to talk about one more thing, which is uh, OAuth. Um, so on Android, where we have uh, created a new API uh, in order to do authentication um, via the phone. So what happens is um, when you when you click on uh, a link, uh, oh, sorry, when you click on a button on the on a watch, uh, then we can launch a OAuth flow on your phone. So there will be a web page, and it support both uh, iPhone and uh, an Android phone. Uh, for the user to type in a username and password on the phone and log in. And it has been really, really popular uh, for our app developers. Um, but one of the things uh, or side effects of having a um, uh, Play Store on the watch is that it could be the first time ever that the app developer have, have actually interacted with your app uh, on the watch. And so previously, you might assume that, hey, the first time the user come to me will be via the phone. But now, it could be from the watch as well. So when you're launched, launching the OAuth flow from the watch, we will also argue that you need a register button. Because this could be the first time the user have actually ever encountered your app. So in your OAuth flow, please add the register button as well. So you could, the user can register as well as sign in. So that's stand alone. Last but not least, Android Wear for China. Um, so not many people know this. We, ha we have actually, uh, we, we actually have uh, Android Wear. Um, and it is actually our second uh, around the world. The first is, of course, the US. Um, so uh, important market uh, for We have a lot of users that, that is using it in mainland China. But uh, not all of Google. Um, so before you um, uh, use any of the Google Play Services API, you will really need to check um, that they are available. Um, to be honest, these are good practices anyway, but just want to highlight um, kind of the two ways that you can do this. Um, the first one is an all or nothing um, kind of way. So you could, when you connect, um, and if the connection fails, you can detect uh, whether the uh, error code is because the particular API that you're requesting is not available. Um, so th this works really well. If you have uh, five APIs and they all need to work together, um, then please do check that using this way. Alternatively, you might have uh, five different APIs, and if three of them work, you know, your app will still run. Um, then you should do this, which is to check for a whole bunch of APIs. And then before you use uh, a certain API, you just check that they're available. And if it doesn't, you might want to fall back onto you know, other, other kind of flow. To help you develop um, that, uh, we have actually um, joined up the, the Google Play services that is for China and for the rest of the world. Um, and the version that you need is 10.2.0. Um, so if you compile uh, your application using that, um, then you could uh, run the same application, uh, both within China and outside. Um, an important, well, two important things to note is one, if you don't use any of the services that is on the screen, so you don't use Google Fed, if you don't use the future location provider, if you don't use the web data layer, you actually don't need to include it at all. Um, and it's just there if you need to uh, use those services. Um, and then the uh, second thing is, um, especially around the future location provider, if you do um, use location on where, then please use this. Um, because what it does is, uh, behind the scene, again, just like selecting the best connection, we also select the best provider of location for you. So let's say the watch is paired to an iPhone, then we'll use the iPhone color location, 
uh, to feed this particular API. Uh, if it's paired to the Android phone, we'll use that. Or if the watch is disconnected, but it has a GPS chip with inside, then we'll use that as well. So we, we do all the logic for you, um, as well as doing all the battery optimization. So if you are using a location, highly, highly recommend that you use the Fuse location provider. And in order to uh, help you test it uh, without having you kind of pay for a ticket and go to China and, and test your app, um, we also have the uh, Chinese version of the emulator available uh, from Android Studio. Um, so you could actually test you know, how your app runs uh, against, that, uh, against the China version of the Google Play services. And uh, for more tips uh, on how to build apps for China, uh, please search for, the, uh, for this page, uh, Creating Android Web Apps for China, where we have got a whole bunch of um, different tips uh, depending on uh, what your application, uh, depends on what your applications need. Uh, just jump to that section. And uh, with that, just to summarize, uh, API 23 with the round and not round is incredibly powerful. Please do try it out. Second, the UI library uh, we have just launched, so any feedback is welcomed. And if you find uh, kind of any, any rough edges that you just want to discuss privately, uh, just DM me on Twitter. And last but not least, uh, well, three things. Um, the tell us if your app is standalone. So that could be an app, watch face, or a complication data provider. Tell us if, it, if they're standalone. Uh, second, really, really important is to assume that your user have multiple devices. They are not cavemen. And um, the last but not least, we are also in China. So um, if you have an app that you think fits the Chinese market, then yeah, please do check it out. And with that, thank you. Do we have time for questions? No. Uh, I think we have a, a couple of minutes for questions. So if anyone has a question, there is a microphone there. Um, cool. Hi. Hi. Uh, do you know if there's uh, going to be any support for Live Cycle in Android Wear? So uh, the question is the uh, support for Live Cycle in Android Wear. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, Android Wear is basically Android. So anything, that, any tool that you use for Android, uh, you can use it on Android Wear. Um, the yeah. So the the only the only thing that I would uh, I would say is uh, around maybe the difference is more around the uh, Google Play services or the Firebase library that you know maybe not all the functions are supported there because of uh, UI that they might need. But for things like lifecycle, it should just work. 